Well, who is my neighbour? That's a question, isn't it? I wonder if you've ever thought about that. In the English language, it's, it's of course an interesting question because the people who live by the side of you are definitely your neighbours. There's no question about that. But the people who live opposite you, well, are they your neighbours or are they just the people who live opposite you? What about your neighbour's neighbours? Are they your neighbours as well? Or is it, are they just almost your neighbours but not quite? Well, who is my neighbour is the question that is uh, brought here. Not a question of geography, but the expert in the law here in Luke's Gospel is asking, who is my neighbour? He's asking, who am I responsible for being neighbourly to? Well, good neighbours are neighbourly, aren't they? If you ever need anything, just ask, they say. And in an emergency, who do you turn to but those who live closest to you? How often is it when someone has a medical emergency, it is the neighbours that help out? And there's that expectation, isn't it? That the people near us are there for us, they care about us, they respect us and our property. The expert in the law that we meet here in verse 25 was someone who would know God's law really well. That's the law that he's an expert in. And God had committed himself in covenant relationship to ancient Israel, that he would be their God and they would be his people. And in return, they were supposed to be faithful to God's law. And so the first five books of the Old Testament contain that law. And at its heart, we know there are the Ten Commandments, which God gave Moses on tablets of stone. But they are expanded out and worked out in different scenarios and situations. And so there is this great body of law in the Old Testament. And this was the law that this expert would know very well. Well, the conversation, they get talking about what God's law requires. How would you summarise it? Uh, what, what would you... What would encapsulate all of those Old Testament rules? What lies at their heart? Well, Jesus and the expert of the law would both agree in this, and and he explains it here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. And that combines two key verses from the Old Testament and an excellent summary of God's law it is. That loving God involves the whole person, it's intellectual, it's emotional, physical. Loving your neighbour with a love as well that you would expect to receive yourself. I remember uh, being taught as a a young child the simple formula of the orders in which we love. So there's Jesus, others and yourself, which conveniently and slightly cheesily makes joy Jesus, others, and yourself. Well, here we have a question of who is my neighbour? Who is my neighbour? Where, where do actually those responsibilities to others, to uh, my neighbours begin? And where do they end? Who, who is my neighbour that I'm responsible for? And who isn't? And I don't have a responsibility. And in, in the back of the mind of this expert, it's probably a sense of of where his neighbour is about loving people who are also part of his nation, part of the nation of Israel, who are Jewish. That being your neighbour is about looking after your own, and that's the the limits of his understanding of who his neighbour is. Well, Jesus tells this parable to answer that question. And so first of all, this morning, we have a good neighbour, a good neighbour. Now, Tenterden is a bit like Jerusalem, in this way, in that it is on a hill, and for almost everyone, and perhaps everyone, you will at least go downhill a little bit before you get home. Well, Jerusalem is like that as well. Here, I think we're about 62 uh, metres above sea level, and if you would travel to travel 18 miles, if you went south, you would end up in the English Channel, and hopefully at sea level, if you can swim. Well, here we have a, a picture here of a man travelling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And in that journey of around 18 miles, he's making a, a, a distance from 750 metres above sea level 
to 250 metres below sea level. And you think, well, how, how can that be? How, how can you be below sea level? Well, it's, it's a big hole, I think, there that hasn't filled up with water. So that's, that's how it works. But this was a really dangerous journey that he was travelling across a wilderness. It had some notoriety to it. And this unidentified and, and Jewish man was going down this route when he is attacked, robbed, beaten and left for dead. And I guess that wouldn't be something that was exceptionally surprising to those who were listening. That's perhaps something that would have been on the news, so to speak, in their time, that sort of thing happening. And Jesus builds suspense in the story, for a priest happened to be going down the road. He just happened to be there, this, this pillar of the community, this respectable guy in the providence of God. It just so happens that a priest was going down the same road. And when he saw the man, you know, we're expecting he, he would help him, wouldn't he? But no, he passed by on the other side. And that's not what's supposed to happen. And, and then we have the Levite who comes next. And uh, there's a sense, well, maybe he took a little bit of a closer look uh, and decided, you know, am I going to help this guy or not? But he too passed by on the other side. And as it's a good story, those uh, listeners would be expecting a third character to uh, come along, someone who's actually going to come and help this uh, poor guy. But they're not expecting what happens next. And uh, that video explained it well, that it is a Samaritan of all people who, as he travelled, came where the man was. The Samaritans, they were hated. They were the enemy. The Jews, they considered themselves to be religiously and racially pure. And the Samaritans definitely weren't that in their view. They were utterly compromised in both of those counts. They were a product of intermarriage with surrounding nations. And their religion was all mixed up too, a corrupted form of Judaism. Yet in the story, it is this Samaritan who responds to the man's need. And he does everything he can at cost to himself. He binds up the wounds, perhaps with a cloth that's torn from his own garments. He soothes and disinfects those wounds uh, with oil and wine, and he puts the man on his own donkey, which means, of course, that he will have to walk himself. And he stays that night to care for the man, and leaves him in the care of the inn. And those two silver coins, those two denarii, which are given, could have paid for a couple of months' stay. But he's very keen to ensure that if there's any more expense, that it is himself that bears the cost. And not the man. Well, we can say that the Samaritan has indeed taken excellent uh, care of this man, both for the health and social care that he needs in order to make a full recovery. So how does this answer the question, who is my neighbour? Or as Jesus puts it, which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? That's a, an exam length question, isn't it? Well, the expert of the law, he, he can't even bring himself to say it was the Samaritan. It's almost like it's a, a dirty word for him, but he concedes that the one who had mercy on him was a neighbour to him. Well, if the people who should be your friends, the priest and the Levite, if they fail to help you in your time of need, then the question must be asked, are they really true neighbours? But if your enemy reaches out to help you. It's fair to say then he has become a neighbour to you. It is doing the stuff of neighbourliness which makes you a neighbour. And the commands that Jesus gives at the end, which is go and do likewise, challenges that expert that if he's travelling down that road from Jerusalem to Jericho and he sees a Samaritan man in that same scenario, then he should be extending that same level of care and concern to him. And it is deeply challenging stuff for it confronts all of our natural prejudice. And the ethics that are taught in our society today are influenced in a big way by Jesus' teaching, but especially this parable. I, I don't know about you, but this is something I didn't just grow up hearing in Sunday school in church, but in school. And I probably 
many of you could say the same. We used to sing the song, when I needed a neighbour, were you there, were you there? When I needed a neighbour, were you there? And the creed and the colour and the name won't matter, were you there? And cross over the road, my friend, another song that alludes to uh, this parable and the fact that we're to show care uh, for all people. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to be in a society that's been influenced uh, by this, that we're not just to look after our own tribe, but to look beyond that. But secondly, this morning, there, have, there is something else going on here which we need to look at. And that is the question of what it means to have a good life, a good life. And that really brings us back to the first verse of this section in, in verse 25, where this expert asked Jesus his opening question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He wants to know that when all is said and done and God's kingdom comes, when the dead are brought to life, am I going to make the cut? What do I need to do to seal the deal? How do I live a good life now in order to make it into the heavenly kingdom? And that's how Jesus, and he get on to this question about what the Old Testament law requires. If you keep the law, then you will live. Do this and you will live, Jesus replies in verse 28. And things start to unravel in a way for our experts because he, he gets this. And he really does believe that in keeping the rules that are, that are, in, that are in the Bible, that he will have uh, eternal life. <coughs> he thinks in a way that he is almost there. He, he wants to justify himself and, and to make sure that he measures up. And we get that in verse 29, that he was asking this question, who is my neighbour? Uh, because he wanted to justify himself. But there is a self-deception which is going on here. For in a way, this expert in the law is trying to ensure that the rules are adequately defined so that he is enabled to keep them, so that he can be confident he's on the road to heaven. Do you see that? Do you see that in asking, who is my neighbour? It's, it's a question about how do I get this command that I find in the Bible about loving my neighbour? so that it is enough within my ability to keep it. What limits can I, can I put on who my neighbour is? Where can I have boundaries? And the religious leaders of Jesus' day, uh, the priests and the Levites, they, they really love to get everything right. And it's why all the time we come across these extra rules that they have in there to, to stop them breaking God's law. And at its heart, it is about ma maintaining control. And so that's something that our human nature loves, isn't it? We love to define the edges of what is or isn't acceptable. We love to define the limits of where our moral responsibilities lie in order that we can maintain that image that we are good and righteous people. I don't know about you, but I've been following the aftermath of the Grenfell disaster and the uh, report that's recently been published. And we saw in that disaster, in that tower block, which caught fire and 72 people sadly died, has, has resulted in massive questioning for government and for the construction industry. And the judge who led that disaster, uh, he produced uh, this diagram, which was called the Grenfell Web of Blame. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, piece of work. For in it, it shows all of the individuals and organisations uh, who were involved in the, in the construction of the tower and how it was managed and maintained and how the materials that, that were used to clad it were, were put there. And it's this enormous web of blame where you've got a one, one lot of people blaming another and they're blaming them back and then over here, someone else is, is, is blamed. And so this, this great uh, web, as everyone tries to put limits on their responsibilities, to say, it wasn't my job to know which of them proved to be a neighbour to the people who lived in that tower block. As human beings, we love to diminish our own responsibilities. 
But the parable here shows that doing God's will for our lives is not a question about establishing ever more detailed boundaries and following ever more rules in order to limit our responsibility. But it is about getting to the heart of doing what is right. Here, the despised Samaritan, the natural enemy of the man who was attacked and robbed and beaten and left for dead, he proved to be a neighbour. He responded in love to the man's need. He did what God's law required, even though it transgressed all of the divisions in society and all the natural prejudice. So when Jesus says, go and do likewise, he is saying, there are no limits. You have to take God's law as it is in all of its comprehensive nature, in all of the expansive consequences that there are there. It demands wholehearted devotion to God utter consistency and compassion and response to the need of others, implication after implication. If we allow God to speak through the law, you have to do it all. If you want to get to heaven, you can't negotiate with God about how you think his law should be understood, interpreted and placed within a framework that you can, you can do. You need to do it all and to do it in the right spirit and reflecting its good original intention. Do this and you will live. But thirdly, this morning, we have a good God, a good God. And there's a lot one can learn from this conversation here with the expert of the law. But Jesus is in many ways, he's in this a tricky scenario, isn't he? He's being attested, he's being set a challenge by this expert. And there's a sense that if he says the wrong thing, you know, what's going to happen? Is he going to get criticised for it? But he's very wise in the way he answers. He, he, you know, there's always this danger, isn't there, whenever you, one is debating people, that it just becomes a shouting match. You know, who can shout the loudest? Uh, and uh, who, you've got to get your point across and, and be heard. And if you go in with that attitude, of course, you never get anywhere. You'll never convince anyone of anything. But Jesus really engages with these questions. And I think there's a real sense of care and concern for this expert as he, as he works through it. Uh, he, he works step by step, and they start really with what they share in common, which is a respect for God's word. And this expert has been working out what he can do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus has shown him the full extent of that demand, and, and it's so complete, isn't it? And through telling the parable, Jesus has got this expert to acknowledge that full scope, that full extent of what God's law demands. And now he needs to think about whether he matches up. Can he meet that requirement? Is he living up to God's standards? And I think as he goes away and reflects on it, he will want to look at this inheritance of eternal life in another way. He needs another way to inherit eternal life. And what about us? Do we understand what we're called to by our Creator? Do we know that our lives are supposed to be those who show God's glory? Who we're called to be those who are righteous? And do we measure up to that standard? Is our love for the Lord complete? Is it with our heart and our soul and our strength and our mind? And is our love for others, is, is it like this Samaritan, are we committed and compassionate and sacrificial every time we're called to be a neighbour? If our position is that we think that by doing, we might be capable of reaching the standard for eternal life, then we're on shaky ground. In fact, we're on more than shaky ground. We're not standing on anything at all. For the best of all the things that we can do are profoundly compromised and mingled with our own self-centeredness. We need another way to inherit eternal life, seeking to justify ourselves like this expert was. That's never going to work. Asking God to judge us by what we do will ultimately see us fail the test. It will see us in hell, not in heaven. We will not inherit eternal life. And the Apostle Paul really takes up these themes in his letter to the Galatians. He says, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, cursed is everyone 
who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. And so Paul then goes on to explain the gospel, that there is another way, not through perfect rule keeping, but through faith in Jesus, who took the curse of the law, who paid the penalty for our law breaking, that we might have the blessing of relationship with God through looking to Jesus. For the expert of the law, this go and do likewise offers an opportunity for reflection, to think through what has motivated his doing. What underlies all that performing of deeds? He needs to think through whether he truly does know and love God, or whether he does, in fact, does not yet know him at all. Jesus pointed out, didn't he, that the priests and Levites and the religious leaders of the day had missed the point of what it means to follow God. He shows that in all of their religiosity, all of their attempts to live a righteous life, they did not make that standard. And there's something deadly in religion. If we come to God's word with a desire to justify ourselves, that motivation means that as we interpret the scriptures, we subtly shift the meaning in order to get everything on our own terms. We're by nature those who deceive ourselves, people who skew God's truth in order to be kind to ourselves. And Jesus returns our understanding of the Old Testament back to where it should have been, that God's heart and purpose in his self-revelation is not to create smug, self-satisfied, a religious elite, but to bring about true justice, to break down the barriers which divide us, and to undo the curse of sin and death and hell. Jesus is himself the true embodiment of the righteousness of God. He is truly the one who fulfills the Old Testament law, the one who is truly devoted to his Father and the true neighbour to others. And then if we are believers this morning, the story of the Good Samaritan, it is of course an ethic we ought to live up to. Absolutely it is that. But it also pictures the goodness of God, the righteousness of Christ, in the saving work of Jesus Christ, he has met the standard. He has done what is needed to inherit eternal life. Jesus came offering relationship with God the Father through himself, the Son of God, and a relationship that isn't based on merit, it isn't based on the things that we have done, but it is based on our need. And in coming to save us, Jesus is surely the greatest example of neighbourliness one can imagine. That from the vantage point of eternity, God saw our need, our living death, our moral emptiness. And how did he respond? Did he pass us by? No, he responded with love for his enemies. The Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Are you, like this expert of the law, seeking to justify yourself? Think it through. When you've given up on righteousness through works of the law, through your own moral worth, when you see what self-deception that is, then come to Jesus, for he is the true neighbour who saves us in our need.